Hello, welcome back to BDO Facebook Live. I'm Monica, and today we are here with Dr. Ed McDonald. Hey, what's up, everybody? Hello, thank you so much for coming. We definitely appreciate it. And fun fact about you, okay. you are a chef, correct? Yes. Nice. I'm and then a doctor and a chef. Doctor and a chef. And what type of doctor are you? I'm a gastroenterologist, so GI doctor. Very nice. So today we are going to be talking about all of these fad diets, from keto diet, Atkins diet, just to name a few and how you feel about them. So let's right. jump right in. Let's do it. Okay, right. so these fad diets, especially the keto, which I keep hearing more and more about, Yeah. how do you feel just overall fad diets? We'll just start there and then we'll go into individual ones. Okay, well let's back it up a little bit. So I in general, so I also have a weight management clinic. So I do weight management at the University of Chicago. I started a clinic really uh, primarily because years ago myself I was overweight. So I used to probably be like 100 pounds bigger than what I am now. And one of the reasons I went to a culinary school as a doctor in medical school, they didn't teach us anything about nutrition. So I, oh yeah, they, they teach doctors nothing about nutrition, not even a little bit. So I had to learn all this stuff on my own to some degree. And part of that learning process entailed me going to cooking school, culinary school. So I always loved to cook, but um, you know, I really wanted to just go there and, and officially like get trained as a chef. So that's what I did, and you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm here now. So, in terms of diets, uh, personally, I don't like using the word diet at all. I say that to me either. It's a yeah. scary word. It's a, it's a terrible word. Like, I think the word diet needs to be banned from the human language. Like, we need to take it out of the dictionary and like, yes. throw it in the trash over there. So, one of the reasons why I don't like the word diet is really because uh, it has so many negative connotations associated with it. People hear diet and immediately, you know, people get turned off. People yes. think about, like, food that doesn't taste good. People think about, you know, not eating a lot of food, and it's just all this negative stuff. And at the end of the day, like anything that we eat um, is a diet. So our pattern of eating is a diet. So if you just eat nothing but potato chips, you're on a potato chip diet. Right. <laughs> if you eat, you know, vegetables, fruits and vegetables, you may be on a plant-based diet. Uh, but nonetheless, it is all a diet. A diet right. Uh, so I don't even want to get into like like say fad diets, we could just talk about fad patterns of eating. Okay, about, I like that. Eating a lot. So ultimately, uh, ketogenic diet, or any, any fad diet in general, we have to look at one, is there any evidence behind it? Uh, two, where's that evidence coming from? Right. So uh, an article on a website written by, you know, who knows? Right, by anyone on by any anyone, website, right? Yeah, <laughs> that, that may not necessarily be yeah, evidence, right? right. Uh, so I'm talking about scientific studies, I'm talking about people who have personal experience and testimonials, uh, but I'm also talking about like what's the purpose of the fat diet. Right. So a lot of times people get on these diets uh, for you know weight loss or to prevent certain diseases. Uh, so whenever someone's trying to figure out a fad diet or a pattern of eating, uh, they really have to understand like what their ultimate goal is. Uh, and when I see people in weight management clinic, I, I always start with like what their goals are, what the motivation is, uh, before we start talking about food and you know ways to treat, tweak what they're eating. Okay. Uh, um, so if a person was looking for a long-term goal, like yeah. you know with their weight loss, you wouldn't really recommend like one of these fad eating habits. Well, I would. I typically recommend what has evidence behind it. And, and for a lot of my patients, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily solely come in with the goal of losing weight. People come in with the goal of really trying to eat healthier. Okay. And they really want to figure out a pattern of eating that is not only going to help them lose weight, but also live, you know, just an overall healthy life so people can live to the age of 100 and, and beyond and, and still be healthy. Because uh, people also want to avoid, you know, cancer. Uh, they want to avoid dementia. They want to avoid diabetes, you know, high blood pressure. And all these diseases that definitely have a component Based upon what we eat, uh, so a lot of people are looking for a way of eating to decrease their risk of developing some of those conditions. Right. So you know, there's nothing out there that's going to be 100 percent effective, and that's one of the reasons why I don't like some of these fad diets because when you go on the internet, yeah. people make these claims like eat this way and you never have cancer. Right. Uh, and that's like that's just not not true. Now there are things we can do to decrease our risk, yeah. but Chances. the end, right, and there's nothing that we could do to just completely take away the risk. Like it just it doesn't work that way. Of course. And on top of that, it seems like it's not really well, in my opinion. But you let me know. Okay. It doesn't seem realistic to stay on like these fad diets for like the rest of your life. No. So as opposed to maybe if you had an event or like 
if it was just like a quick fix and you're like, oh, I have an event coming up, I need to lose this amount of weight as yeah. fast as possible, like then it kind of makes sense to do one of these fad diets, but to say, I'll do this for the rest of my life, I don't... It doesn't make sense. Yeah, it and, doesn't. And there may even be some long-term health concerns. Right, right. So we could talk about the ketogenic diet. Okay, so start there like the keto diet. <laughs> super yeah, popular. Question. All yeah. right, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Answer them, guys. Like keto, the keto diet, there's like multiple forms of it. People have talked about dirty keto, clean keto, you know, your classic keto. Ultimately, a ketogenic diet is going to be a diet that uh, typically may have uh, a lower amount of calories than other ways of eating, uh, but the diet really emphasizes decreasing carbohydrates and uh, eating mostly fat and some protein. So on paper, a keto, your standard ketogenic diet, 60% of your calories comes from fat, and uh, only about 15% of the calories come from, uh, from carbohydrates, uh, and the rest comes from protein. So it's really uh, a classic low carbohydrate diet, and uh, it, you know it's similar to the Atkins diet. Uh, the only difference between keto and Atkins, uh, the ketogenic diet is going to have more fat than the Atkins diet, and a little bit less protein than the Atkins diet. But uh, both of those are two low carbohydrate ways of eating. Now, ketogenic diet it really got popularized, at least uh, in the medical literature, because there is some signs that it may play a role in decreasing seizures. Okay. Uh, so for children who have epilepsy, yeah. uh, the ketogenic diet, I mean, in people especially who have refractory epilepsy where they're always having seizures and they're not necessarily responding to medications, ketogenic diet, helps. it helps. And it, 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 it's a reasonable thing to try. So while doing this diet, the Atkins and the keto diet, wouldn't a person um, tend to lose muscle mass and kind of become fatigued and well, so the ketogenic diet, uh, people can definitely lose weight with a ketogenic diet. Uh, but the issue with the ketogenic diet is really just a tough way of eating. Yeah, uh, it seems tough. It's super I tough. don't even know if I could try it. I, I mean, in order to eat that, that few amount of bars, uh, it is, it's really tough. And people are doing a lot of high fat foods consistently. And there was a recent study that just came out not too long ago that brought up some, you know, some legitimate concerns about the ketogenic diet or other low carbohydrate diets compared to, you know, just kind of a middle of the road carbohydrate diet. So they found that uh, from the long term uh, perspective, the ketogenic diet may actually uh, increase our risk of developing heart disease. Yeah, so I was going to ask about that. So increase the risk of developing heart disease and other cardiovascular diseases, primarily because the diet emphasizes fat so much. So for people who are trying to lose weight, I mean, from the short term, it may help you out, yeah. but from the long term, it is just not the best diet to be on. Uh, and there's no studies that really show any population on the planet that has had this high fat diet that lives to like the right, right. age <laughs> of 100 or so. Okay. So. When I'm in clinic, I always talk to people about the blue zones. Have you heard of blue zones? Blue zones? No, explain what that is. So blue zones are areas of the planet where uh, they have a higher uh, prevalence of people who are living to 100 uh, or definitely into their 90s yet remaining healthy. Okay. Uh, so there's five areas that have basically been defined as blue zones and it came off of uh, research from National Geographic. Mm -hmm. So the five areas are Loma Linda, California. Uh, there's a place called Icaria, Greece. Uh, there's a place in uh, Sardinia, which is a small island off the coast of Italy. Then there's Okinawa, Japan, and there's also um, a small town in Costa Rica. I um, knew the U.S. wasn't going to be on that list. Well, Loma Linda, California is... But the, nowhere else. But nowhere else. Just, okay. just Loma Linda. And the reason why Loma Linda specifically is a blue zone is primarily, primarily because Loma Linda has the highest population of Seven Day Adventists in the United States. Oh, and Seven Day Adventists, so yeah, so they're a Christian, you know, religious group, but what separates them from everybody else is that they're mostly on a plant-based diet, so they're mostly vegetarians. Okay. And the, the other populations, what they all have in common, most of these populations are mostly on plant-based diets. Uh, so they're not all vegetarian, but most of their energy and most of their food, it, oh. it comes from plants. So they may eat meat every now and again here and there. Yeah. But it's not like an everyday, every you know, every meal thing like the standard American diet. Right. So when you look at literature like that, you know, there's no one on this high fat, ketogenic, paleo type diet uh, in any of these blue, job, blue zones. And what all the blue zones have in common is basically people are eating more plants and more fruits and vegetables, which also contain carbohydrates. 
So ultimately, if you're looking for a pattern of eating, eating that may sustain you throughout your entire life, you gotta eat the fruits and vegetables. Like right. that is just hands down the way we should be eating. Um, and some of the fad diets really go against some of those principles that have a lot of evidence. I've noticed that. And so it's weird that we're promoting that but indeed, like you said, we need those carbohydrates in the fruits and vegetables. We need healthy carbohydrates. Uh, so what we don't need, and what I do like about some of the fat diets, so, you know, and I don't even want to say fat, some of these patterns of eating that have been popularized. Uh, so like the Whole30. Uh, what I like about Whole30, it emphasizes staying away from some of the processed foods. Uh, well, that's good. That's, that's great. great so yes. the processed foods that we eat nowadays, like this stuff is like, it's horrible, it's killing us. I mean, like it's literally killing us. Uh, to the point where people are literally losing limbs and going blind off the food that we're eating. And that's like, that's crazy to me. Um, there was one study that looked at, uh, for the average American, how much calories in our typical diet comes from ultra processed foods. So I'm not even talking about like regular processed foods, I'm talking about ultra processed yeah. foods. This is like the superhero <laughs> of processed foods. foods. Like it's like the next level processed foods. Um, so the study found that for the average American, 60% of our calories come from ultra processed foods. 60%. 60%. So this is the average American. This is not like, right. you know, there's no, they, they, they even looked at race. Uh, and it's, it's tempting to say, well, you know, black people probably eat more ultra right. processed foods. That's garbage. Everyone. Uh, Everyone, this is this is an issue that affects all Americans. So in the study, there was no difference between white people and black people in terms of how much processed food, ultra processed foods we ate. The only people who ate significantly less were people who uh, recently came from immigrant families, so okay. immigrants or people whose parents were immigrants. Uh, and right, it makes sense. And so a lot of foreign countries, they have healthier diets than we do. Right. Uh, and that's why a lot of these countries, you know, people tend to live a little bit longer. So I think United States, in terms of uh, our overall like longevity and lifespan, uh, how, <laughs> no, it's not that good. I think wow. we rank like 31st out of all the different country, developed really? countries in the world. Yeah, we spend the most amount on healthcare, uh, yeah. which is crazy. You think you know if it's something that we could spend our way into long life, we'd all, we'd be number one. That we would change something, yeah. Right, but it's not about how much money we spend on healthcare. It's a huge component of it is what we actually eat. Um, we got we to gotta eat healthy. We have a lot of questions about um, different plans for different people. Um, one person wants to know what would you recommend for um, as someone who's diabetic as far as eating plans go? Okay. Uh, someone who is diabetic. So, one, uh, it depends on what the hemoglobin A1C is and how well controlled their uh, blood sugars are. But ultimately we know that for diabetics, maintaining a healthy body weight is important. Uh, and we know that when someone has diabetes, if they lose 5% of their body weight, uh, every 5% can translate into an improvement in their hemoglobin A1C. And for those who don't know about hemoglobin A1C, so hemoglobin A1C is a marker that we use in the clinics, the blood test, to see how well people's blood, can sugar, have, blood sugar has been controlled over three months. Okay. Um, so for the average person, uh, we define diabetes as having a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 and above. Uh, Pre-diabetes starts at like 5.7. Uh, so everyone's goal is typically to be out of that pre-diabetes right. range, so less than 5.7. Um, so for your average diabetic, according to the endocrinology guidelines, again, the diet that really has the most benefit for someone with diabetes is going to be a low glycemic diet uh, and one that's rich in fruits and vegetables. And what I hate about the way uh, doctors instruct people with diabetes to eat, yeah. oftentimes people say, don't eat fruit. And that is really? like, that is totally wrong. Like people with diabetes can eat fruit and they should eat fruit. And that's like in the, in the diabetes guidelines that unfortunately a lot of doctors don't even look at. Because like I said, we're not trained right. on nutrition. We're trained on giving people insulin. Why are they being told not to eat fruit? Because people just assume that fruit has sugar, yes, okay. and people with diabetes shouldn't, shouldn't eat anything with sugar. Yeah. But fruit also has uh, what's known as phytochemicals. Mm -hmm. So these are plant-based chemicals that typically, so the, the fruit, uh, their pigment, uh, the things that give the fruit color, uh, these are all phytochemicals that have um, health benefits. So we think about like lycopene. So lycopene gives fruit a red color. 
So watermelon, uh, tomato, they're all high in lycopene. And studies show that lycopene decreases prostate cancer. Um, and all the other, you know, pigments also have important health benefits in us. And for people who have diabetes or are not eating fruit, they're missing out on some of those health benefits. Then, yeah. And some of those health benefits, you know, could, could uh, you know, have anti-inflammatory properties, can also decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease, which people with diabetes have a higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease, almost the highest risk. Um, so for your average diabetic, I would say, you know, eating a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, staying away from processed foods, um, and looking up a, a low glycemic index diet. So there are certain foods, certain carbohydrates that are going to raise your blood sugar more so than others. And, uh, you know, those are high glycemic foods. Uh, the lower glycemic foods, typically when you eat them, uh, they don't really raise your blood sugar all that much. And primarily because the high glycemic, or the lower glycemic foods typically have more fiber in them, and it's harder for our body to break down fiber. So it takes a long time for us to digest foods that have a lot of fiber. Right. So we never really get a, a rise in our blood sugar because, you know, we don't immediately absorb the sugar in the food. Eventually. It Eventually. Might. I mean, it's a slow process. But, you know, foods like pop and juice, so all those sugars are easily absorbed. And once you, you know, drink like a pop or juice or, you know, some sort of sweet or dessert, your blood sugar is going to spike immediately. And that causes your insulin to spike. And that's also one of the reasons why people with diabetes or pancreas gets burnt out. So the pancreas, you know, it just stops making insulin or they stop responding to insulin. So they have what's known as insulin resistance. Uh, and another issue with insulin, Again, insulin uh, tells the body uh, to like store energy and calories as fat. So these insulin spikes, in theory, can increase our risk of gaining weight too. So it's one of the reasons why you know sweets and everything are associated with weight gain. Uh, so speaking of foods associated with weight gain, uh, a lot of times when people ask me about a diet, I go back to a study that was done in New England Journal of Medicine uh, back in 2011. 2011. So really dope study. Uh, what they did was they wanted to figure out which foods were associated with weight gain and which foods were associated with weight loss. Uh, That's all we want to know. <laughs> right. Please tell us. Right. So, I mean, like to me, it's a, it's a dope study. Yes. Like they didn't, you know, look at these crazy diet plans and everything. They just, just, they just looked at like, what are people like, eating yes. and what happened. So what they did was they took uh, like 122,000 people and they followed them for 20 years. And they had, uh, over that 20 years, they had the people write down, uh, do food questionnaires in terms of what they were eating every day. 20 years. 20 wow. years. Okay. And they keep track of all this stuff and what they were eating. And throughout that time period, they monitored people's weight. So after the 20 year period, they could go back and see, well, like, well who really gained weight over 20 years? Yeah. Uh, and what were they eating? Who lost weight over 20 years? And what were they eating? So what they came up with, uh, there was a list of like five foods associated with weight gain, five foods associated with weight loss. Uh, so the foods, and, and I don't want to say foods, but really categories of foods. Right, categories. Okay. And so, you know, there's nothing groundbreaking crazy here. It's all stuff that, if you think about it, it all makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> so the foods that were associated with weight gain, uh, basically people who ate potatoes frequently in any form. Now does that mean like one potato? No. It's not one potato. I'm talking about people who did potatoes consistently, yes. weekly as part of their diet. Oh, and and what I mean by potatoes in any form, I mean uh, it doesn't doesn't matter if it was a boiled potato or, right. or a baked potato or French fries or potato chips. Like if it came from potato, then you did it consistently. It's in that category, <laughs> right? People okay. who did that have a high had a higher likelihood of gaining weight in this study. Uh, now that doesn't mean potatoes aren't good. I mean they're tasty. Don't get me wrong. Right. But, you know, this is what the numbers show. Too much of it. Yes. Too much of it, okay. you know, you know, tends to go, it tends to add on some pounds. So, other foods, uh, fried foods. Right. So, Makes you sense. know, the fried fish, fried chicken, uh, potato chips count as a fried food, tortilla right. chips count as a fried food. Uh, people weigh more of those consistently and they're gaining more weight on average. Um, and one of the reasons for that is whenever we fry something, it basically soaks up all the oil that we cook it in. Yes. So it just adds more calories than whatever, you know, the amount of calories. And with that, does it make a big difference when someone's like, okay, well, I'll fry it in a different type of oil? Doesn't make a difference. Okay. Yeah, it just soaks Sorry, up all guys. the calories. <laughs> okay. So the, the oils uh, have a lot of calories in them, and that's just the, the bottom line. Oh, I know okay. all the oils do. Okay. 
Now, I mean, there's some oils that may have some benefits when uh, we eat them raw, uh, like extra virgin olive oil. Right. So, going back to those blue zones, uh, one of the blue zones, or at least two of them, uh, the one in Sardinia and the one in Greece, uh, a lot of people have olive oil uh, as a significant component of their diet, especially a lot of their fat really came from olive oil. Okay. But we're talking about like extra virgin olive oil, right? Not, not the deep fried <laughs> stuff. This right. is like on salad dressings, and okay. you know, people were dipping vegetables in it and stuff like that. Oh, okay. The stuff we're not doing. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, want, I mean, if you deep fry something in olive oil, right. like don't. It's don't, not healthy. It's not healthy. <laughs> And it's easy to think that because when you yeah. go on the internet, people are like, oh, olive oil is great, so let me just deep fry right. olive oil. Like, it doesn't work that way. Right. And uh, same thing with coconut oil. So coconut oil is super popular nowadays. Yes. But from a chemical perspective, coconut oil is not too far off from butter uh, when it comes to saturated fat. Now, coconut oil, I mean, it's plant-based, um, so, you know, it may be better than butter, but it's still an oil. Yeah. Uh, so it's not one of those things. At the end of the day, it's still oil. And, you know, those blue zones, there's nobody who's just like, oh, I ate nothing but coconut oil. Right. <laughs> I live to be 100. Like, it just gotcha. doesn't work that way. Was there a question? Yeah, so one of the viewers wants to know, is breakfast really the most important part of the day? Um, so, I want you to talk about that, but then can you also go into, like, the benefits, the pros and cons of intermittent fasting? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and those, those are two related topics. Yes. Uh, so, breakfast and intermittent fasting. Okay, uh, let me start with breakfast. So, there's a lot of studies that, you know, kind of go back and forth in terms of like, is breakfast okay, should right. skip mm -hmm. breakfast, is it bad to skip breakfast? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the answer always changes. Okay. Uh, but I think the answer changes primarily because everyone is a little bit different, not everyone is the same. So it's hard to say everyone needs to eat the same way uh, because that doesn't really take into consideration individual differences and stuff like that. But what I will say, uh, in my weight management clinic, um, almost 90% of the people who I see in weight management clinic skip breakfast. Uh, really? So if I had to look at like just a recurring theme mm -hmm. of people who come in to see us, it's a lot of breakfast skippers. Uh, and looking at the literature that supports eating breakfast, uh, some of the concept behind eating breakfast, at least when it comes to weight management, is that people eat breakfast, especially breakfast that's going to have fiber and some protein, right. uh, they typically are going to be less hungry throughout the day. So right. in theory, you eat less. Um, and we know that eating late at night is not yes. good. In yes. terms of, you know, for a lot of different reasons, but specifically not good for gaining weight. So another thing that I've seen in my own, my own weight loss clinic is uh, night shift workers. So people it's who- It's completely different. Oh man, yeah. people like get on that night shift and start working nights, that like completely throws right. off metabolism and everything. And I don't know if the average person is supposed to be eating lunch at two in the morning. Right. Like, that's just not what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> and and not only it throws off everything in terms of weight gain, but it may even promote inflammation. So for me as a gastroenterologist, I also see a lot of people with Crohn's disease. Right. So anecdotally, I've seen a lot of people, you know, that will control Crohn's disease, we don't have to make any modifications to their medications. And then they switch over to the night shift. All of a sudden, they're having flares, and you have to put them on steroids, and all this crazy stuff. Uh, but the only difference was they started working the night shift. Um, so going back to breakfast, I think breakfast is really important. And uh, I try to start my day off with a simple breakfast. And, and what I tell people, uh, we also have this misconception of what breakfast is. I was going to say, I'm sure it depends on what you're eating for breakfast as well. Right, so breakfast can be super duper unhealthy. Yeah, I mean, right. Like if you're eating pancakes, at the end of the day, pancake is cake. Right. It's all that stuff. It's cake. All that, yeah. Right. It's cake made in a pan. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that's what it is. And for me as a chef, when you know, I like I you know make pancakes for my family occasionally, especially on Saturdays. I got a young kid. I wake up early, make right. pancakes. Um, but I've made cakes. I took you know bacon and pastry and all this stuff. When you look at the ingredients in pancakes and the ingredients in the cake, it's, it's like the same stuff. stuff. It's, the same. <laughs> it's the same stuff. Maybe different ratios, right. uh, but it's the same stuff at the end of the day. And then you can say, well, you know, pancakes don't have frosting, but when we put the syrup, when we put syrup <laughs> and butter on it, syrup. right? It's you know that's right. the icing on the cake. It ends up being the same, right? It's in the, it's the same thing. Uh, so breakfast, I tell all my patients, like we need to throw out everything we know about breakfast. Like breakfast does not have to be, you know, bacon, eggs, pancakes. 
Uh, doesn't have to be all this traditional stuff that we've ate in America. Oh <laughs> and in the rest of the world, they don't eat, you know, bacon, eggs, and eggs. Like, that's not breakfast. You look at what they eat in France for breakfast and, like, Completely different. it's very different. Yeah. So I see a lot of people, you know, doing a lot of, you know, vegetables, a lot of fruit, a lot of healthy stuff. So ideally, you know, an ideal breakfast, from my perspective, is going to be something that contains fiber and it's something that has a little bit of protein. Um, so, you know, a good source of protein for breakfast uh, for people who aren't vegan uh, or who aren't like strict vegetarian, you can do, you know, just plain Greek yogurt. And going back to that study in terms of foods associated with weight loss, uh, Greek yogurt is one of the foods associated with weight that. loss. Yeah. Um, so I don't have any issue with people doing Greek yogurt. Uh, and, and instead of like buying a Greek yogurt that already has like the, the fruit in it and like the sweet stuff in it, like buy the plain stuff and sweeten it up yourself because that puts you more in a position to control what you're actually taking in right. as opposed to getting something that, you know, they could easily turn Greek yogurt into a processed food. Like you just want to get the plain stuff. If you want fruit on it, fine, you know, get some blueberries and some blackberries, throw it yeah. on there. If you want just a little bit of sweetness, you know, hit it with just a little bit of honey. And if you want some vanilla, you can use, you know, your vanilla extract uh, and just pour it on there. I was there. going to ask, so it's better to use honey as a sweetener than sugar, obviously. Or is it, are they well, almost it, the same? They're almost the same in terms okay. of the way we process it. Uh, honey may have, you know, some other health benefits to it. Mm -hmm. But in terms of calories, it's, it's more or less the same. Okay. Uh, so just switching over from sugar to honey. Um, if you make that switch, don't do it because you expect to lose weight. Okay. Because um, you know it's just not that different. And the healthiest sugar that actually has some health benefits to it. So there was a study that looked at uh, which sugars have antioxidants. So antioxidants are chemicals in the body that can uh, decrease our risk of developing cancer. And it's important because we live in an environment where there's chemicals that can increase our risk all around us. Yes. You know, plastics, uh, you know, soaps and stuff we put on our skin, like stuff is everywhere, smoking, air, pollution, etc. Uh, so it's really important for us to get a lot of anti antioxidants to kind of protect ourselves. So um, the study looking at antioxidants and sugars found that uh, date sugar, so sugar date that, sugar. yeah, so okay. date sugar is delicious. Uh, it's sugar made from dried dates. So all they do is take the dates, which is a fruit, uh, dry it and crown it up and you know oh. that's all it is, date sugar. Nice. Uh, so that has the most antioxidant of, antioxidants of any sweetener okay. uh, and then molasses actually has a decent amount of antioxidants. Uh, so those two sugars or sweeteners uh, may actually have some health benefits beyond just you know adding sweetness to it. Right. Um, so for me in my oatmeal I definitely use some date sugar or I even make my own date paste. As a matter of fact on our website I have a good recipe on how to make date paste. Right. Uh, you just take your dates and you soak them in the water uh, for like, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You take the seeds out and then put them in a blender and then you got a paste. And you can use that in your smoothies, you can use that in oatmeal or whatever. Uh, Very so, nice. it's pretty healthy. And so, as far as breakfast, we said stay away from the cakey foods, the bacon, all of that. Yeah, and maybe oh, some and bagels. Man. And ba oh, yeah. Like that's bagels. all bread. That's all like bagels. And bagels are so good. They're so good, it's so good but they're, they're not. They're not right. There's just too many calories. So some of the foods we should be eating. You mentioned oatmeal. I heard also hard boiled eggs, or maybe like scrambled egg whites. Yeah. So like, I mean, the hard things are better. The hard boiled eggs uh, for people who aren't vegans, uh, you know, have protein, so they can be a good source of protein. Uh, and right now, I think the American Card College of Cardiology recommends that. Uh, people who are doing uh, eggs, they shouldn't have, they shouldn't go for like three eggs a week. Um, so keep it limited uh, to some degree. Uh, but ultimately, it's a good source of protein, and uh, I encourage people to find you know some sort of fruit or vegetable to eat in the morning. So I see a lot of people doing hard boiled eggs, but they do it in the context of a breakfast salad. Right. So get your hard boiled egg, chop it up, you know, throw it on some baby spinach or something like that, and then you can add you know bit of olive oil or something to it, uh, make your own dressing, and you know, it'll be a good breakfast salad. Nice. Uh, other good things for breakfast, if you're into bread, um, you know, I like doing avocado toast. So avocado toast, yeah, that's super duper popular. And toast to wheat bread. Well, uh, not all wheat bread is created equal. Okay. So you have to be able to identify the fake wheat bread, because unfortunately that's out there. How can you do that? So Wait, 
Oh, are you going to bread? With the eggs, you said no more than three per week? Yeah. And so why is that? Because uh, of cholesterol. Okay. Yeah. So three per week should be fine. Uh, getting above that, you know, maybe a little bit not the best thing for the average person. Uh, but again, everyone is a little bit different. So there are some people, three eggs may be too much, uh, depending right. on your ability to process cholesterol. So folks who have family history of heart attacks or have heart attacks themselves, probably shouldn't be doing with three eggs. If you have a history of heart attacks, uh, you may want to go to the whole food plant-based diet, because that's where the evidence is. Uh, but for the everyday general person, yeah. who, you know, who's not a smoker, who doesn't have all these other risk factors, you know, three eggs shouldn't be anything to worry about. Okay, great. So we were talking about how to tell the difference of good wheat bread and bad. Because I just see wheat bread and I'm like, okay, great. <laughs> I'm healthy. Right. So you really want to look for something whole grains. And so whole grain wheat bread, uh, a lot of times you'll see the grain on the crust. Right, right. Um, and the fake wheat bread, you know, it just looks brown. But okay, yeah. I've unfortunately, seen that. unfortunately, which, which is crazy, like literally they have these stores that will take white bread and they'll dye it. Uh, really? Yeah, and they call it wheat bread. <laughs> I did not know that. So, That's good to know. my favorite breads to Tricky. use, um, and I try not to do too much bread because, you know, breads do have yes. a lot of carbohydrates. And uh, back to that study that showed foods that uh, were associated with weight gain. Mm -hmm. So, basically, a lot of foods that were fine grains. So foods that came from flour and such as bread. Um, but whole grains were associated with weight loss. So the best breads on the market, in my opinion, I love Ezekiel bread. Uh, so the Ezekiel bread uh, is in the frozen section of the, the supermarket. So a lot of good breads are actually so healthy and so nutritious, they can't even leave them out because oh, they'll spoil. In a few days, yeah, yeah. they'll spoil. Okay. They'll spoil. So uh, they're in the frozen section. So Ezekiel bread actually uh, comes from, there's a biblical passage, I think it's like Ezekiel 4-6, oh, okay. uh, where they go over the recipe on how to make Ezekiel bread. And uh, my own remember the passage exactly, so for, you, you know, the Bible scholars out there, don't, right. don't make me up if I get it wrong. Uh, but it's something to the fact of, you know, take, you know, whole grains, lentil, uh, and sprout them, and then, like, make a bread out of it or something. Okay. Uh, and that's the recipe that Ezekiel bread is made out of. So it actually has lentils in it, it has millet, uh, a lot of different whole grains that are really healthy. Right. healthy. So for me, when I do my avocado toast, I'll just grab a frozen piece of uh, Ezekiel bread, throw it in the toaster, and uh, I'm a busy man. I mean, I have to wake up early and get to right. work and get to, you know, help get the kids off of school and everything. So I'll grab just some guacamole. Uh, sometimes I make it myself. Sometimes I get the pre-made stuff from the store. But I'll grab some guacamole, you know, slap it on a piece of bread, and then uh, I always have, like, some chopped up cauliflower. Mm -hmm. uh, people can buy cauliflower rice, um, sprinkle that on there. And then um, I always have like some baby spinach in the house. Throw some baby spinach on top, and boom, you're good to go. Good to go. Like I have a healthy, delicious breakfast. Uh, drink a glass of water, get an apple, and you know that's a well-rounded meal. Um, and then I may even throw some hemp seeds on it to add more protein, uh, because some hemp seeds are a good source of protein and make free fatty acids. Oh, okay. So another thing you can do with toast, uh, almond butter toast, is a yes, good alternative. Yes, I heard about that. So almond butter toast is dope. Like I'll grab the same Ezekiel bread, put some almond butter on there, throw some chia seeds on there, some of the hemp seeds, maybe some dates, slice up some apples, put the apples on there, and it's a nice well-rounded breakfast. It's way like different I, than pancakes. Way different than pancakes. <laughs> yeah, get quick. I mean, it takes me like five minutes to do Much that. faster than pancakes and bacon too. Faster. The Ezekiel bread comes in different flavors, if you will, like they have the cinnamon raisin and yeah. All that. So is it okay to do all of them, or should you stick to like the basic one? So, I mean, there's a gluten-free variety, there's a sesame seed variety, uh, there is a cinnamon raisin. So the cinnamon raisin, I mean, I've never had it, I'm sure it probably tastes good, because like, who doesn't love cinnamon raisin? Right? <laughs> but, you know, it's probably going to have a little more calories than your regular uh, Ezekiel bread. But the other varieties should be fine. Be careful with gluten-free stuff because typically they add more fat and sugar to gluten-free stuff just to make it taste good. Uh, so, and that goes back to the gluten-free diet. I was just I was gonna ask you about that. One yeah. more question. Because um, going back to like butters and oils, is it is there a healthier version? Like, I can't believe it's not butter or something like that. Like butter alternatives that people can use. Yeah. So the butter alternatives. Um, 
I wouldn't recommend them because a lot of those butter alternatives have trans fats in them. Uh, so the margarines and all that stuff uh, may actually increase the risk of heart attacks more so than regular butter. Uh, so if you were going to do butter, uh, doing grass-fed butter is probably better than doing, you know, the non-grass-fed stuff. Uh, um, but ultimately, the grass-fed it would say that on the package, like yeah, it, it, it was. Okay. It'll, it'll typically say on the package. Okay, it'll say that. Okay. So if you go to your average grocery store, I mean, the two brands of grass-fed butter, I think there's Flucra is one one brand, and then there's a uh, Kerry Gold. Kerry Gold is another grass-fed okay. butter that's pretty easy to find. Um, but you know, ultimately, the goal is to not do a whole lot of <laughs> yeah. oils. And olive oil on paper is probably the most studied oil that has health benefits. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, coconut oil may have some health benefits, but again, uh, since oil has so much calories in it, yeah. it, you could easily, you know, get a lot of calories just from like some, a few tablespoons of oil. Uh, so you really have to be careful. Right. So as far as gluten-free diets, are we on board with that? Do we still get all of the health benefits that we need from that? Oh, so gluten-free diets. All the nutrition that we need. Yeah. So let's let's break it down. Uh, one, what is gluten? You know right, what I mean? Right. Like, like, what what I what I hate about fat diets. We have a lot of people making claims, or I see people. When, you know, I do talks in the community, whatnot, and people come up to me like, "Yeah, I'm on a gluten-free diet," and then we start having a conversation. So it's like, wait, wait. <laughs> What does that mean to you? <laughs> right, you? You didn't know what gluten is. Right, right. And then people are like, oh, I really don't know what gluten is. <laughs> um, so I'm not trying to gluten shame people. Right. But, I mean, explain so we all know. Right. <laughs> uh, so gluten is a protein that's in wheat, rye, or barley. And um, it gives pro it gives bread its, uh, its kind of structure. And like, if a bread is like real tough, yeah. that because, that's because it has too much gluten in it. Uh, if a bread is real fluffy and light, uh, it doesn't really have a lot of gluten in it. So when you're, you know, the difference between like uh, a baking, a pastry flour, or a all-purpose flour or bread flour, the bread flour is going to have more gluten okay. than your pastry flour because, like, you don't want your cake to have the same consistency of like uh, a baguette of French bread because right. that would be a terrible cake. <laughs> um, so that's all because of gluten. Now. The gluten, uh, gluten-free diet really got popularized primarily because of people who have celiac disease. Mm -hmm. So celiac disease is a condition uh, that affects a small bowel and it prevents people from, I mean it's really kind of an inflammatory condition where people can get anemia and get diarrhea and a lot of bad symptoms. Now on paper it mostly affects folks of the European background uh, and it actually, you know, I don't want to say it rarely occurs in African Americans. Uh, African Americans don't get diagnosed with it. Okay. Now, does that mean it doesn't happen? Right. I, I don't know because people haven't really done that, those studies. It just that means people don't get diagnosed with it. And what's interesting? Um, so years ago, when I did my nutrition fellowship at the University of Chicago, I had to work in celiac clinic. And um, you know, I'm here at this clinic, and one of the biggest celiac centers in the world. And I saw no black people coming through. And we're in the south side of Chicago. Like, man, where are, where are black folks <laughs> with celiac disease? Right. Um, so that was a question that like always bothered me. Yeah. And I'm like, is it because we're not getting diagnosed because we don't have access to doctors? Is this is racism? Are people yeah. just saying like black folks don't get celiac disease? So it bothered me. And um, I actually looked up some studies to see, well, like, let's let's see who studied celiac disease first. Yeah. Yeah, first in black people. And I found one study. I mean, you can look this stuff up. If you go to the internet and go to PubMed and Google African American celiac disease, one thing that pops up. Um, and it was a study out of Columbia by a cat named Peter Green. So Peter Green, big celiac researcher. And uh, he looked at his population of patients at his celiac center in Columbia, again, one of the biggest centers in the world. And I think out of thousands of people, he only had nine African Americans who had celiac disease. So I'm like, this is kind of crazy. Yeah. Uh, so I decided to do my own research. And I'm like, well, let's figure out, you know, if, so celiac disease, uh, you have to have uh, a genetic predisposition. Okay. So people have to have genes that allow them to develop celiac disease. So I'm like, well, do black people carry the genes for celiac right. disease? Uh, so I'm like, I want to find out. Now, in order to do that type of study where you just, you know, are drawing blood on a lot of people, it takes a lot of money. You gotta get NIH grants and all this other stuff. 
But I realized that uh, in order to get uh, an organ transplant, they have to check the genes, and they check those same genes that allow celiac disease. So when I was a fellow at Rush, I uh, got access to our transplant database, and I'm like, well, let me just see if you know there are more black people who have already checked these genes on that have the genes for celiac disease compared to other groups. And what I found was uh, black people, we carry the same, the same rate of the genes for celiac disease as white people. Um, so that means celiac disease, in theory, is popular, yeah. even though it's possible in black people. Or it just means we may have other protective genetic mechanisms that haven't that been identified. That allowing us to, right. to not get celiac disease. Yeah. But going back to your gluten-free diet, uh, that said, you know, there's really no evidence that anyone who does not have celiac disease needs a gluten-free diet. Okay. Um, and a lot of these gluten-free foods are super-duper processed foods. So when people are trying to do gluten-free, you know, cakes and cookies and whatnot, yeah. like don't look at them like they're healthier because they're gluten-free. Oh, okay. Like if anything, they're typically more unhealthy because to make up for the lack of gluten, and like There's I said, other, they put other more fat that. and more sugar to make it taste better. Because like most of the gluten-free stuff, it just doesn't taste good. Yes. <laughs> so they gotta do other stuff to make it taste good. And, good to know. and there's studies that show that people who are on gluten-free diets who don't need to be on a gluten-free diet actually have a higher risk of developing heart attacks and heart disease. Uh, so if you're gluten-free in terms of like I'm just not eating bread and I'm sticking to you know vegetables and stuff like that, that's fine. That's a healthy, that's a vegetarian diet right. where you're just not doing bread. Uh, that's cool. But doing these gluten-free products, probably not the greatest thing. Wow. <laughs> I feel like we just learned so much and we covered so much. So I do want to ask two last questions. Yeah. For all of these diets or the pattern yeah. of, of eating, would you say that before starting one, a person should talk to the doctor? Because everyone's different. So well, seeing results maybe on someone else, you may not see the same results on you. Or if you have a health condition, you should maybe talk to your doctor before trying or starting one of these Right. Diets. So if you have a health condition, definitely talk to your doctor. Specifically, if you have diabetes, if you have chronic kidney disease, you know, certain diets may, you know, like a plant-based diet, maybe a high potassium diet. Your kidneys can't handle potassium, it's not a safe thing to be on. Um, if you are concerned about weight, uh, there are doctors who specialize in weight management that may be able to assist you. I was you going to ask, so if you have a health condition, should you maybe not ask your doctor, but maybe ask a nutritionist? Because before, when we were talking about diabetics yeah. and they were told not to eat um, <laughs> fruits but maybe a nutritionist would maybe explain a little bit different saying that you can indeed eat fruit yeah so Just maybe in moderation and all of that it, you know a registered dietitian and even a nutritionist is a that's a complicated term yeah because you know you don't necessarily have to go to school to, to be a nutritionist. nutritionist okay so a lot of times people who just talk about nutrition can claim that title. They just say I'm a nutritionist. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's just like they went to, you know, mom and pop's back alley school with a nutritionist. Okay, so who should we be? Maybe not a nutritionist, but who should we be? Well, some nutritionists know what they're talking about, mm -hmm. but you just you really have to look at credentials. Uh, but a registered dietitian is someone who went to, you know, school to okay. get a dietitian. They have to get licensed. They have, you know, tests that they have to take to get certified. So going to a dietitian is definitely uh, better than going to a, your average doctor for nutrition purposes. Okay. Hands down. Your average doctor, again, like there's no classes on plant-based so, diets and like And that's interesting. I just assume that doctors would just know, you know, how... I mean, things are changing. The background on well, nutrition. <laughs> so we should. Yeah, right, it would right. Make sense. I would assume, yeah. But the reality is that's just not what's called in medical school for the most part. Now, that's changing, so I teach culinary medicine uh, to the med students at the University of Chicago. So we're in the kitchen learning nutrition and cooking and everything. But that's one of the few institutions that has a program like that. Um, most places don't. And when I was a medical student, we just, our nutrition lecture was like a lecture on vitamins. And, and nowadays, you know, the vitamins really don't even do much of anything for most people. Like, get your vitamins from food as opposed to you know, some little pill. Right. Uh, and that, literally, that's what the research shows. And so when people ask me about vitamins, that's what I tell them. Like, don't worry about vitamins, eat them, vegetables. Right. Um, so, you know, if I want to leave people with just a couple different things, um, I think ultimately, 
you know, some of the fad diets may help with weight loss, uh, but ultimately, a lot of these weight loss diets are just not sustainable. So when people do these very low calorie diets, uh, be it you know the apple cider vinegar or lemon juice diet or something like that, like yeah, you may lose 10 pounds, but for the average person, you know that 10 pounds is going to come right back. Right. And uh, that yo-yo dieting effect, where you lose weight and gain it right back and lose it again, like over time, it makes it harder for you to lose weight. So your goal is really to find a diet that's more sustainable as opposed to just a fad diet uh, for 10 days or something right. like that. Um, fruits and vegetables, hands down, like I know I said it over and over again, and I said it over and over again because I really want to emphasize the importance of eating more fruits and vegetables. Um, the, the average American, uh, we just don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. No. So there was one study that looked at how many Americans actually uh, meet the you know requirements for fruits and vegetables. Only like 9% of us did. Really? Yeah, it's nine. And that's not like 9% of black people. That's 9% no, of everybody. Uh, so when people, you know, try to have a stereotype that African Americans eat less healthy than everybody else, like I tell everyone who thinks like that, that stereotype is BS. Uh, everybody eats unhealthy in the United States. And to single out any one group is just kind of disingenuous. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's just not recognizing facts. So we all have to step up our nutrition game. I mean, that's just, if, if we want to live a longer, healthier life that, you know, has lower risk and rates of cancer, we, we, we got to eat different stuff. And that's starts our, with nutrition. It starts with nutrition. That's the bottom line. Yes. Um, and then let's not even talk about exercise and that's a whole other story. And, yes. and sleep and all that stuff, because that plays a role, it, too. Yeah, it all plays a big part, a huge part. A huge part. And uh, I know we didn't have time to get into some of that. But I recognize that, you know, we got to look at the whole picture. Uh, and maybe next time we come on, we can talk about, like, how to incorporate that whole picture. Yes, please. Cool. Yes, thank, thank you so much for coming. Dr. McDonald. Oh, it's a pleasure Hope to be here. you guys learned a lot, like I did, for sure. Please don't forget to talk to your doctor, talk to a nutritionist, talk to a, a diet. <laughs> Dietitian. A dietitian. Yeah. <laughs> and please do your research before starting any of these diets. And don't forget, don't call it a diet. It is a healthy lifestyle change. Right. Hope you guys join us next time. Please share this post so we can all get more knowledge on this matter. And don't forget to like us on Facebook. Until can, next time. Can I plug my website real Yes, time? of course, yeah. your website. Go. Yeah, uh, so check out the docskitchen.com uh, if you want to get more information about food and nutrition. Uh, it's my website, I throw some recipes up there, and I write about food and nutrition and some of the stuff that I've been talking about, but I go a little bit further in depth. Yes, and the website is in the comments, so please check that out, you guys. It's amazing. Thank you so much. All right, cool. Thanks. Bye. Peace.